Well, today we're going to be in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter number 1, verses 26 through 28, and uh, the title of the message is Making the Impossible Possible. And I'll begin reading in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be the son of the highest, and the Lord uh, God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Well, let's begin today by looking at the manifestation of the angel we call Gabriel. It says, Now in the sixth month, and they were dating that from the time of Elizabeth's uh, pregnancy. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to Galilee, uh, in the region of Galilee, and the particular city called Nazareth, to a particular woman, a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name, we're told, was Mary. Now Gabriel, this angel, is one of three angels that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, he appeared to Daniel, he appeared to Zacharias and Mary, and all three of them were fearful when they first met him. Gabriel, we're told in the Bible, stands before the presence of God. The other two angels that are mentioned are Michael and Lucifer, and uh, two out of three are the good ones, and we know Lucifer is the bad one. But uh, Gabriel and Michael seem to occupy different offices and have different uh, 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 realms of authority when you read what they do in the Bible. But when we're talking about Mary, and we're told that the virgin's name was Mary, John MacArthur made an interesting comment. He said, Mary's virginity protected a great deal more than her own moral character, reputation, and the legitimacy of Jesus' birth. It protected the nature of the divine Son of God. Jesus had to have one human parent, or he could not have been human, and thereby a partaker of our flesh. But he also had to have divine parentage, or he could not have met, lit, uh, made a sinless and perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Now notice the enunciation in verses 28 through 30. And having come in, Gabriel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. When Mary saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And when we have favor with God, there's no need to be afraid. You know, there's a difference between having the fear of the Lord, standing in awe of God's, uh, God's many different attributes and his power and his holiness, and being afraid of God like we would run in fear. But Mary was told to not be afraid. She had found favor with God. That reminded me of a verse over in Psalm 106, verses 4 through 5. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. O visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. And the purpose of Jesus being born in that manger was that we might find salvation in him and through him that we would not fear God, but we would be in right standing with him. And Psalm 35, 9 says, my soul, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Now notice the articulation, how, how Gabriel spelled things out as to what was going to happen. 
He said to Mary, You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. You know, there's no greater name than the name Jesus. Gabriel went on to say he will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, the Messianic prophecy being fulfilled in Jesus. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, which would be Israel forever and ever, and, his king, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Warren Wiersbe was a favorite of mine. And he said, great names come and go, but the name of Jesus remains. The devil still hates it, the world still opposes it, but God still blesses it and we can still claim it. In the name of Jesus is the key that unlocks the door of prayer and the treasury of God's grace. It's the weapon that defeats the enemy and the motivation that compels our sacrifice and service. It's the name that causes our hearts to rejoice and our lips to sing in praise. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 4.4 when he was under house arrest, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. But the name of Jesus... Isaiah got it right in chapter 9 and verse number 6 when he spoke about Jesus. He said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When I read the New Testament, I see the name of Jesus framed in many different ways. John wrote about it in 1 John and called him the atoning sacrifices for our sins. In Hebrews chapter 12, he's referred to as the author and perfecter of our faith. In Revelation 22, 13, he's the beginning and the end. In 1 Timothy 6, 15, he's the blessed and only ruler. In John chapter 6, John presented him as the bread of life. In Ephesians, Paul wrote about him being the chief cornerstone. Peter would write about him in his first letter, chapter 5 and verse 4, and call him the chief shepherd. John referred to him in chapter 10 of his gospel as the, uh, as the, chief, uh, uh, as the chief shepherd. Uh, the great shepherd in Hebrews 13. The great high priest in Hebrews 4. The heir of all things in Hebrews 1. The holy and true in Revelation 3.7. And John the Baptist referred to him as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And in John chapter 4, when the hearts of the disciples were troubled and they were wondering how they could meet God, Jesus said to them, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. In John chapter 8, he introduced himself as the light of the world. In Revelation 5.5, 5, the line of the tribe of Judah. The hope of glory in Colossians 1 and the great I am in John 8 verse 58. And Paul would write in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 11 and tell us that God is highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now notice the specification. Gabriel got, really got down and, and specified some things to Mary. He explained everything to Mary, and then Mary said, she says, I've got a question. How can this be since I do not know a man? And Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. What God did for Elizabeth and what God was working in Mary was the impossible becoming very possible. We see it time and time in the Old Testament, God doing the impossible. Uh, he did it through Abraham and Sarah. He did it with Noah earlier in the ark. He did it with Moses in the crossing of the Red Sea and sustaining those wandering uh, uh, Israelites for 40 years in the desert. He did it in the book of Daniel for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well as Daniel in the lion's den. You see, our God is the God who makes the impossible possible. Warren Wiersbe said, in sending his son to earth, God caused eternity to invade time. This was not a temporary visit. When Jesus came, he wedded dust and deity, time and eternity into one. The eternal word was made human flesh, and that union will last forever. Why? Because God takes the impossible 
and makes it possible. And I believe in the virgin birth. There's several reasons. When I read the Bible from front to back, the scriptures verify it. And when you study the history of how we got our Bible, all of the ancient manuscripts hundreds and hundreds of years ago contain the words of the, and the story of the virgin birth. If it was a lie, those, those old, old saints would not have died the death of a martyr for a lie. The virgin birth is true. The early church fathers like Ignatius and Irenaeus both wrote about the virgin birth of Jesus. Ignatius said he was truly born of a virgin. And Irenaeus said Christ Jesus, the Son of God, because of his surpassing love towards his creation, humbled himself to be born of the virgin. Thereby he united man through himself to God. The Apostles' Creed and all of the ancient creeds uh, asserted the truth of the virgin birth. The Apostles' Creed said, Conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Church history attests to it. Since the inception of the church, whether it's, whether it's in the form of the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, the Protestants, the Baptists, whatever, they've all verified the virgin birth, and you see it, if nothing more, in the stained glass windows and the art collections of the churches. Andrew Murray, the old prayer warrior, said, Christ is the humility of God embodied in human nature, the eternal love, humbling himself, clothing himself in the garb of meekness and gentleness to win, to serve, and to save us. And Charles Wesley said it just about as good as it could get in your favorite song, Harold. Hark, the herald angels sing. And the word, here's the words. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. We've got a God who takes the impossible and makes, makes it very possible. Let me give you just four times where the word impossible is used. In our text in Luke 137, with God nothing will be impossible. In Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And then in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You see, Jesus is the Lord of the impossible, and he miraculously intervened time and time in the lives of many. And when we preached our series on the Gospel of John, we saw this. But let me remind you of a few things. There was a miracle of alteration in John chapter 2 at the marriage supper of Canaan when there were more guests than there was wine and Jesus altered the nature of that old stale stagnant water and changed it into the finest wine those people had ever tasted. There was a miracle of separation in John chapter 4 when Jesus was more than 20 miles away from the person that needed a miracle. A Roman centurion came to Jesus and begged him to heal his son, and Jesus spoke the word, and even though there were many miles between them, the boy was immediately healed. There is a miracle of restoration in John chapter 5. At the pool of Bethesda, a man who had been crippled for 38 years would go there every day hoping for a miracle. And Jesus commanded him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk, and immediately strength was restored to his legs. There is a miracle of sustenation in John chapter 6 when Jesus took the five loaves and the two small fish and fed a crowd, sustained them, a crowd of over 5,000 people. There was a miracle of regulation and, uh, when, when Jesus was uh, offshore about three miles and the sea became very rough and his disciples were petrified. They were fearing they were going to be swamped and that they would drown. And Jesus walked across the crest of the waves and spoke the words and calmed the sea. There was a miracle of extrication. In John chapter 9, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the light of the world and he healed the eyes of a man, extricating him from the powers of darkness and bringing him into the light. There is a miracle of restoration when Lazarus died in John chapter 11. And Jesus simply said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And I'm not certain exactly what the, 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 the very exact words were, but I know Jesus in essence said, rise Lazarus, and he lived again. Jeremiah had it right in chapter 32 and verse 17 when he said, O sovereign Lord, 
You made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. That's because we've got a God who routinely, routine, routinely can make the impossible possible. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul said, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, so that you and me, so that all of us by his poverty might become rich. I'm not sure who stated this, but I want to share it with you. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us, to, sent us a savior. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, Paul said, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And that's why Jesus came and was born in that manger, is because sin had separated us from our Creator. And the only way our sins could be paid for, the only way God could make sure our sins were atoned for, was to allow His Son, the perfect Son of God, the unblemished Lamb, to die the death of the cross that through him we could be reconciled to God. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, Father, as we come now, I want to thank you for this time together. And it's my prayer, Father, that we might pause to reflect on the true meaning of Christmas. Father, it's more than the gifts under the Christmas tree, and it's more than the mistletoe. It's all about Jesus. And we're so thankful, Father, that he willingly went to the cross for us, that he gave up everything he had in heaven, to come and live a humble life of poverty, that he might give us all, that we might have all that you have to give us, salvation, eternal life. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing a song of invitation. Come whatever you need might be today.